Welcome to Crosspoint, everybody. We're so glad you joined us today. Uh, even if you're here in this hot, hot heat or uh, at home, uh, hopefully you're in some air conditioning. Uh, but uh, let's stand up and worship our King.
grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the spirit between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I would never be alone. It was another
So last hour, I told everybody, pretend, pretend you're in Arizona and it'll feel cool, but I don't think that applies to this hour because it's warm. Also forgot to say, because people were asking me after, the shirt says Coca-Cola in Hebrew. A good friend of mine got this last year when the church went, and it was very nice of him to bring it back to me because we all know Coke rules. Okay, so if uh, you're... If you're our guest and uh, in person or online, uh, we're so glad you've come to be with us today, and we'd love to hear from you. If you would text the word WELCOME to 714-868-7258, we'd love to hear from you. Touch base a little bit. We promise not to hound you. Uh, you'll just get a text and, uh, and or an email, whatever you kind of let us know. But we'd love to hear from you. And if there are needs you have or a spiritual uh, direction. We'd love to help you with that, too. Maybe you made a decision for Christ. You could text Jesus to us. You just want to know more about what it means to know Jesus, because that's what we're about here. We try to let people know about the saving grace of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to forgive our sins and rose from the grave to give us power for living in this day and confirm the promise of being with Jesus for eternity in heaven. So what an awesome thing to share, and we are busy sharing that on all different kinds of levels. We have our kids' ministries back in action. They're in the gym right now, 1030 on Sundays. Yeah, that's, yes, that's great. And then we have two just amazing ministries where we offer care and support and uh, also the gospel. People have been saved through this ministry, uh, both these ministries. One is called Grief Share, and Grief Share helps people who have experienced the loss of a loved one uh, and coach them through that, give them some counseling, give them spiritual encouragement. And then divorce care is another challenge that people uh, oftentimes face alone. And so we want to help people through that. And then we have small groups, and small groups are kicking off uh, the fall session. In three weeks from today, Pastor Bruce will be back in the Gospel of Luke, and our groups will be studying those. And we're looking for two kinds of people right now. If you are interested at all in being a leader of a group, we need you. Groups are where we not only learn and grow, but we find support and care from uh, our friends. So we, we, need, we want everybody in the church in groups, but to facilitate that, we need group leaders. If you're at all curious, if God's put that on your heart at all, please reach out to me. And then, uh, of course, if you're not yet in a group, we want to plug you in to one of the many groups that we have so that you can, again, not only get that encouragement and discipleship, but the support and care that we can find only at church. And then lastly, on September 16th, uh, that's a Wednesday, we will be having a blood drive, and you can sign up for that online. We've been so incredibly blessed and grateful for uh, the financial support and the financial faithfulness of our Lord through the, uh, these tough times, and we are going to take our offering now, and so let's pray. Jesus, thank you for saving us. Thank you for putting a church that ministers so faithfully in this place and around the world. And we just pray that uh, your faithfulness would continue, that you would just keep blessing our friends and family here at church, and that uh, giving would just be blessed powerfully in your name. Amen.
Father, thank you. Thank you for this gathered congregation, Lord, in this second service. Thank you for their commitment to be here, even on what for us is a, a really warm day. Thank you for all the good things in our lives, Lord. May we be grateful and mindful that the very breath we draw, the love of family and friends, your faithful love that brings us together, these are all gifts from you because you love us. God, today we'll, we'll hear from a missionary and we will look across your word together. Help us align our lives with your truth and your purpose, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the committed. 9 a.m. service, that's the big army. You're the special forces. It is something like 92 degrees. I'm not even sure. I don't even want to look because I don't want it to get in my head. But they basically got a small airplane here in front of me. It feels pretty good. If you get too hot, just come stand on the stage with me. You'll feel immediately better. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Bruce Garner. And before we open the Bible together, I want to invite your attention to hear from one of our own, a family from our own church. Several years ago, God brought the Contreras family from the mission field of Spain. Uh, they had uh, an intention to be in Northern California, but by God's grace, and I'm so glad that he did, he sent Joe and Danielle Contreras and their two sons here to Cross Point instead, where Joe and Danielle and their sons, Mike and Drew, have served in every way a person can in a church. And now God is renewing their missionary call. They served faithfully in Spain as a family, Joe and Danielle with their three sons for 15 years. And now God's moving them in an entirely new direction, something that frankly I've never met anyone who serves in this particular community in the world. We are going to support them beginning today. Uh, this week they should receive a love gift from our mission fund and we are going to begin monthly support to help them on their way because those who do not go are called to help support those who do. I want you to hear what God has laid on the Contreras family's heart. Uh, help me welcome our friend and our brother, Joe Contreras. Thank you, Pastor, and good morning. And I only have five minutes, but uh, I feel like I want to stay right here for more than that. But um, as, uh, as Pastor said, um, we've really enjoyed the, the blessing and privilege of being part of this church. And as, as he said, uh, my two youngest sons, uh, Drew and Michael, um, serving in music and also in VBS. Uh, my wife absolutely loves teaching uh, the children with the, uh, the children's ministry, and, and it's just been a blessing for me to be a part of the worship team, and I've always asked God just to show me how I can give back to him in service and give uh, to you, his people, and I just you know, praise the Lord for the opportunity to uh, be part of this church serving. Uh, but as Pastor mentioned, uh, I just want to share a quick testimony. You know what happens when you tell yourself um, that you're never going to do something, right? Uh, you know how that usually ends up. Well, I just want to share a quick testimony along those lines. As Pastor mentioned, we were missionaries in Spain for 15 years in church planting. We came back in 2014 for what was supposed to be a planned furlough, but has actually turned out to be a six-year break uh, from the foreign mission field. And the Lord, three years ago, brought us here to Cross Point Church. It's been a blessing because this church has ministered to my family, but it's also kept missions in the forefront of our minds. And so just last year, last summer, uh, here in Huntington Beach, unexpected, un unplanned, we ran into some friends from Bible College that we hadn't seen in literally 20 years. We caught up with them, just stopped what we were doing, and caught up with them at Bellaterra Mall, and we, we shared with them what we had, had been doing in Spain. They started sharing with us their ministry as directors of Bethlehem Evangelical Academy, uh, not in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or Ohio, but actual Bethlehem in Israel, in the Palestine um, West Bank. And, and the Lord just started to burden our hearts about that. We've, uh, um, we've kept in touch with them follow their ministry and in January they posted a need for teachers so in their school it's uh, their 
classes are taught in English and in Arabic, and they have mostly Palestinian teachers, but they needed some native-speaking English um, teachers and also support for their Bible program to make it less of just a religion class and more of um, an actual Bible class. And so the Lord started to stir our hearts. We sent them our resumes. Uh, we filled out their application, and consequently they interviewed us. Is actually right here in the uh, student center uh, through Skype. It was... 6 in the morning their time, 9 o'clock at night here. And we just had a great conversation talking about the challenges they typically have out there in their school and just different approaches we might consider in, in, in the ministry there. And so after a great conversation, they invited us to join their staff and faculty. Uh, we sought the Lord's will on it. And he just really started to stir our hearts uh, about uh, joining their team. Um, things that I, had never, that I told myself I would never do I told myself I would never go back to another mission field unless it were Spain again. And I also told myself I would never go to the Middle East. I just didn't think that God was calling me there. I, I told myself I would never go to an uh, Islamic uh, country as a missionary. But the Lord changed my heart. I would say this is probably the biggest change he's done in my heart since my own conversion to Christ for salvation. The fact that he changed my heart and is burdening our hearts uh, with just as much passion as we had to go to Spain, maybe even more, to go to the West Bank and just serve in these communities. And I started asking myself, what would Christ be doing right now if he was actually walking that uh, area of the world? And he just brought me to Acts 1-8, um, where he tells the disciples in his absence that they should be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, and of course the uttermost parts of the, of the world. But I... It, it, the Lord spoke to my heart that that's exactly what Christ would be doing if he was here. He was, he'd be a witness, even now, in, in Bethlehem, a, a city that is synonymous to Christ, but yet very needy. It's, Christianity is declining. It's about 85% Muslim. And I believe Christ um, still intends that all Judea and Samaria still be part of the Great Commission. And Christian education just provides a great opportunity to not only be a witness to the students, but the parents, even the teachers, and in the community. So I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate uh, just all the Lord has done in our hearts in this church. And just um, proud to be part of the missionary family of this church. And I, we definitely appreciate your prayers. We're going to be leaving for the East Coast at the end of this year. And Lord willing, by summer of next year, uh, be getting started in the school year out there at Bethlehem Evangelical Academy. So we're with um, a resourcing Christian education as a mission board, and um, uh, they approved us back in February, and so we just thank the Lord for how he's been leading at this time. Appreciate your prayers. Let's pray for the Contreras family, shall we? Father, we're so grateful. We are blessed as a church family to serve and support some of the most courageous people I know people who really can't send very explicit letters telling us what you are doing in parts of the world that are dangerous to their very lives. And now we're pleased, Lord, to join hands with the Contreras. Would you speed them along their way? Would you open doors of support and prayer for them? Would you move in the hearts of churches across, Lord, the country to be generous with them financially to help them uh, get to the place where you've called them to serve. Uh, bless their sons, Lord, in their absence. Uh, though the family will be separated, Lord, we trust they will be united in heart. And I know uh, Mike and Drew are very, very proud, very grateful uh, for this new call on their parents' lives. So bless them and encourage them and help us faithfully do what we should to be part of that story. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everybody have your bulletin. Today will be an especially helpful day because, believe it or not, we're going from Genesis through Revelation in about 30 minutes. The reason is simple. There is an idea that ties the whole Bible together. And you should never read the Bible merely as a history book. Never read the Bible merely for information. If you take this journey with me and you only hear information, you will have missed the purpose. God provides information for sure. The Bible is filled with it. But the purpose for His information is actually the transformation of your very life. 
And there is an idea that begins in Genesis chapter 12 that l runs literally through the entire Bible. That's 66 books written across some 1,400 years of history. Once you see it, you'll never forget it. It unites the ancient city of Ur where Abram was raised by people who worshiped the moon 2,000 years before Jesus was born. It starts there, and it runs all the way to the throne room of God in things that have not yet happened in future history in the book of Revelation. And it's an idea that ties it together. It's not the invention of a pastor or a preacher. Any careful Bible reader who reads the Bible from cover to cover can see this strong idea running from beginning to end, and it's ideas that matter. Ideas change the world. A generation ago, President Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that single sentence and the idea behind it worked in history with many other factors to transform the world as we know it. A generation earlier, Martin Luther King stood in front of an enormous crowd and said that he had a dream of a day when people would be judged by the content of their character rather than by the color of their skin. It transformed America and it's still working itself out a generation later. In the same way, God's ideas, what God himself knows is true and what God himself is working on is really the lifeblood of the Bible. It's a collection of history and poetry and letters and prophecy, but it is all tied, as I'm going to show you, through a single idea. And for the sake of time, especially on this hot day, I'm going to invite you to open up your bulletin because we're going to move fast through the Bible, and I want to explain to you why this church and why every biblical church cares so much about spreading the good news from this corner all the way around to the end of the world. I want to explain to you why we care about the Contreras family and the dozens of missionaries that this church supports. All of that is organized around this biblical idea. Everything this church does, even ministries that seem, nothing, that seem to have nothing to do with the rest of the world, I'm talking about ministries like grief share and divorce care that are intended to give people comfort in the pain of divorce and in the pain of the death of a loved one. All of those ministries are oriented to cooperating and working out this idea that God placed in his word from cover to cover. So look with me, please. In Genesis chapter 12 first, in Genesis chapter 12, you're going to see the beginning of God's work in the world. Here's the context. For 11 chapters in Genesis, God deals with the whole world at once. In Genesis chapter 12, he narrows his focus to a single person. It's a long time ago, and it's a culture very different from ours, but the idea is actually very simple to understand. God speaks to a single individual named Abram who lived in the time in the country we now call Iraq. The religion of the people from that territory, we believe, were moon worshipers. In other words, Abram's family for generations previously had not known the God who made them and loved them, but in a moment, God reached down into history, spoke to this single individual, and made a promise to Abram. This is entirely by God's grace. Abram had not come to God's attention through his own merit. He had not been good enough. There's no indication that Abram himself was looking for God entirely by God's grace. God reached down into human history and spoke to an ordinary man and made him this promise. This Genesis 12, and to keep us moving along, I'm going to ask you at various times to read along with me. Is that cool? Genesis 12, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred, these moon worshipers, in your own territory, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse 
And here's the bottom line, literally, of God's promise. Here's the bottom line of God's covenant. Read with me what's in bold there, the end of the verse. It says, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's a gigantic promise because Abram, to his own sorrow, has no children of his own. And now he's not looking for God, but God makes him an extraordinary promise. He says, I want you to leave your people and leave your land. You're going to go out to a place. I'm not going to tell you where you're going. You're going to go where I tell you. And along the way, I'm going to give you a great name. I'm going to give you territory of your own. And I'm going to give you a big family. And that family will bless all the families of the world. This families of the earth means tribes, clans, nations. God made a promise to Abraham that through him, every other nation on earth would be blessed. The timeline, if you're keeping score, is 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. 2,000 years before Jesus was born, God started speaking to a single individual, making him a promise so big that only God himself could keep it. Abram could not possibly do this on his own. And the bottom line of the covenant is the blessing of all the nations through Israel. Many promises are made to Abram. You're going to have many descendants. You're going to have a territory. You're going to have a great reputation. You're going to have a great name. But the purpose for all of that is when I have done all this for you someday, all the other tribes, all the other clans, all the families and the ethnic groups that are not related to you, they are all going to be blessed through you. This is what God is doing through Israel. Please remember, when God starts speaking to Abraham, the nation of Israel is not even an idea. The people that will be born from Abraham will become the nation of Israel, but Israel does not exist. Abram doesn't have a single son of his own. This is an improbable, impossible idea, and the reason is God wants to make sure that Abram gets the blessing, but God gets the credit, God gets the glory. And over time, exactly what God promised happened. You can read the story of the birth of the nation of Israel and those 12 tribes and what follows in the book of Genesis. The idea was simple, that God would make a nation in Israel that was so extraordinarily different from all of the pagan, wicked, bloodthirsty, idolatrous nations around it, that the nations of the world would be drawn to Israel. Israel is never commanded to go out and witness to them. That's going to come later. Israel is promised that they will be a nation blessed above all others. And from time to time, if you read your Old Testament, every once in a while you see instances of people who were not part of Israel believing in the God of Israel. That doesn't happen very often, and if you've read the Old Testament, you know why. Even though Israel was promised to be a nation special to God and dear to Him, what did Israel spend most of her time doing? Going after the gods of other nations. Rather than loyally follow and love and serve their God, they continually went after the gods of the countries around them. The bottom line of this covenant is great blessing for Israel, but the bottom line is that all the nations, all the nations around them, all the nations of the world, of the whole earth, in other words, tribes that did not yet exist, tribes that Israel could not have possibly known, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And as I keep reading the Bible, a thousand years later, I can read in the middle of my Bible that Israel understands her purpose. And the reason I know that is because of Israel's songs. See, every country, every culture creates songs to uphold its values. One philosopher said, I don't care who writes to guide a nation, I don't care who writes the laws as long as you let me write the songs. Songs shape people's thinking, shape people's emotions, uphold their values. That's especially true in church. The songs we choose to sing always tell 
the world and we tell ourselves when we sing the best things we know about God and also the highest aspirations we have for ourselves. For instance, we sang today about another person being in the fire. If you haven't read the book of Daniel, that song doesn't make any sense. But if you've read the book of Daniel, you'll read about three young Jewish boys who have been captured and put to work in a foreign empire. They will not bow to the king's idol, and they said, if you don't bow to the idol, you're going in the furnace. And with great faith and courage, they said, our God can deliver us, and if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. And the outcome of the story, and this is one of those times that Israel actually drew in believers from another nation. They were cast into the furnace, but there was a fourth person in the furnace walking beside them, keeping them safe. That's one of those extraordinary miracles in the Bible where God puts his signature on a moment and pagans who were not looking for God believe and trust in the God of Israel. That was their purpose. It only occasionally happened, but when I hear Israel sing, I know that they understand what they should have been doing. Psalm 67 is the greatest example. I want you to listen to this psalm because this is their song. This is how they would have worshipped. This is something that Israel would have sung together in their gathered worship. By the way, they often were in a tent. They were often in the heat. So we're in good company, okay? Listen to Israel sing in Psalm 67. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us. Now, where would they ever have gotten the idea that it was okay to ask God to bless them? That's the promise he made to Abraham a thousand years earlier, remember? May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Selah. That's a Hebrew word in the Bible. It indicates a pause. It's probably a musical direction and also an indication to the reader to stop and think about what has just been sung. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Read the last line. What's it say? Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Can you hear Israel singing for the nations? There's the word nations and the word peoples that keeps coming up in this psalm. What are they singing about? They are saying, God, in our day, a thousand years later, keep your promise to us as you once promised Abraham. Bless us now so that, verse 2, so that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Have you ever heard this little piece of Christianese called you're blessed to be a blessing. You ever heard that or seen that somewhere? This is the biblical basis for that. The reason God blesses his people is not entirely for our own sake. All the blessings that flow through your life, your health, your intelligence, your money, your experiences, your scars and your stars, in other words, the things that are great in your life and the things that have been painful in your life, you have been given all those things, not for your own sake alone, but so that others will be blessed. Israel was set as a light to the nations, not to go out to them, but to draw the nations to God. At their best, when they were singing the songs that reflected their understanding of God, they understood this and sang psalms like Psalm 67 because that's what we do in church. We sing our very best hopes for ourselves. There's an old hymn called I Surrender All. Did anybody ever sing that? If we sang the reality of our day-to-day -day life, what would it sound like? Probably something like I Surrender Some right? Because I surrender all. That's, that's a pretty tall order. But when we sing, we sing the best truth we know at that moment about God and the way we sincerely desire to serve Him. That's what Israel's doing, and for good reason. 
when they were given the law in Exodus 19, listen to what they were told was their purpose on earth. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6 now. God is speaking to Moses so that he can deliver God's purpose and God's law to Israel. Here's what he was told. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. In other words, the whole world belongs to me. But if you do what I tell you, you will be special to me among all the nations of the world. Verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. The interesting phrase in verse 6 is a kingdom of priests. What does that mean? Well, a priest is someone who stands between God and people. The idea of a priest is, humanly speaking, that he will join the hands of God and the hands of people who are far from him. He'll be a bridge, a mediator. That's why the Bible tells us that Jesus is our great high priest that we have no need of human priests and human intercessors because Jesus himself died for our sins and makes us acceptable to God. And God is saying to Israel, you will be a whole kingdom because you belong to me, the king who owns all the earth. You're mine, and what I want is for you, the whole nation, to represent me to the nations around you. And had Israel done this, had they done this in a sustained fashion, we could have seen, presumably, the nations of the earth as that surrounded them, coming into them and loving and trusting the God that they served, that had made them so different, so special, so humane, so loving, so merciful compared to all the nations that lived around them. Now, if you've read your Old Testament, how well did Israel do in living out her purpose? So, so? pretty bad most of the time. Why is that? Because rather than keep covenant with their God, they were always going after other gods. Israel did not fulfill God's purpose for her as a nation. Idolatry cost Israel her purpose, but God kept the whole world in view. Without any conditions and without Abram's initiative, in 2000 BC, God made a promise to Abraham that he would bless through the family of Abraham the whole world, and God was determined to keep that promise. And then the, the focus of the Old Testament begins to shift. And with all of her prophets and all of her kings and all of her servants having come up short in God's sight, God begins to speak of the one servant who will fulfill his purpose. Our next reading is in the book of Isaiah. If you're keeping track of the timeline, this is 700 B.C. now. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah started speaking of the one who would actually do everything that God had commanded this, psalm, this uh, chapter, Isaiah 42, is known as a servant song. It is a song of the one who will serve God as Israel should have. Israel failed, but there is another servant coming who will not fail. And Isaiah, in the servant songs, prophesies what Jesus is going to do for all the nations. Isaiah 42, let me read with you. I'll ask you to join me at a certain point. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. See, this idea is running right through the Bible. God is determined to have a light to the nations. His nation has failed him. They're in captivity. They're in and out of trouble. Some of them are being scattered among the nations that they followed, but God is not giving up. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Let me ask you to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Who does that sound like? 
Whose ministry remind, or are you reminded of in those words? Who could do that? Jesus. Only Jesus. And in Matthew 4.16, we won't take the time to look it up, but in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew the disciple tells us that Jesus starts preaching. And he starts preaching in a place called Galilee of the Gentiles. In other words, it's Israel's territory, but it's famous as a highway, basically a place where the Gentiles are continually coming and doing commerce and engaging with the nation of Israel. When Jesus starts preaching in those places... Matthew says Jesus is preaching here and now because he's fulfilling what Isaiah told us 700 years earlier, way back in Isaiah chapter 42. Matthew, more than any other gospel, is going to explain the life of Jesus from the Old Testament, especially the book of Isaiah, so that you can't miss this idea. The salvation of people from every nation was God's plan all the way along. When God made his promise to Abraham, he had the whole world in view, and he never gave up on that idea. Jesus himself understood it, and after rising from the dead, he meets with some of his disciples, and he opens the whole Bible to them, the Old Testament, I mean, what they had of the Bible at that time, and here's what Jesus said. Luke chapter 24. This is Jesus, post-resurrection, speaking to some of his hard-hearted disciples who don't really understand. This has been in their Bibles all along, but they still don't get it. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking now, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. In other words, before I was crucified, I was explaining all this to you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's the entire Old Testament. That's Jewish shorthand for the entire Old Testament. Verse 45 is amazing, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. That's the sermon you wanted to hear. That's what we need Jesus to do for us still today. Because the scriptures can be preached, what we need is for him to open up our minds so that we can see what's been in the word all along. And he said to them, thus it is written, read this with me, read the words of Jesus with me, beginning with the word thus. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Where is the message of the good news going? Where is it eventually going to end up? All the nations, exactly as God had promised Abraham 2,000 years earlier. The timeline is slow from our perspective, but God never fails. He's always on time. He always keeps his word. Paul is the most Jewish and the most religious of all observant Jews in his time. He was a member of the Pharisees, the strictest group in Judaism. He was the outstanding student of one of the most astonishingly respected rabbis of his day. This had been in his Old Testament, in his Hebrew Bible, the entire time. And once Paul met Jesus, he saw that his Bible, which he calls the Scripture, said this all along. Galatians 3.8 is a letter written to the far reaches of the Roman Empire. These are pagans, pagans. These people have no acquaintance with Judaism. They have no knowledge or respect for the God of Israel. But God sends perhaps one of the greatest Christians to ever live, converted from the, most, the strictest group in Judaism, to tell them that God had them in view the whole time. Galatians 3 verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. In other words... Your Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, foresaw, foretold that God was going to save people who didn't know him, who were not Jewish, who were Gentiles, by simply putting their trust in him. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. 
What that means is when Paul was in places like Rome and Ephesus, when Paul was in Corinth, when Paul was preaching in the Roman province of Galatia, and he was dealing with people who were so far culturally and religiously from the God of Israel, he knew he was taking part in fulfilling God's promise, what God intended all along. So it's not surprising that Jesus commanded us, his followers, to tell the whole world. Acts 1.8, will you read it with me? These again are the words of Jesus to the apostles. They're carry forward to this day. This is why we're participating with the Contreras family in, imagine what God does, we're sending missionaries from the United States all the way back to the land of Jesus' birth because God has all the nations in view. Read Acts 1.8 with me. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And here we are. I won't ask, but even in the small group of people I can see right in front of me, because some of you on the wings are way too far out there, I can see four or five nations represented just right here in my line of sight. Stories that have been circulating in my family were finally verified a few weeks ago. One of my cousins found my mother's side of the family, our tribal registry with the Cherokee Nation. I heard all these years that we came from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I didn't know whether to believe it or not, but they found the documentation. That tells me something kind of exciting. Jesus was dying on the cross with the Cherokee Nation in view. Just right here in front of me, there are people from South America and Asia. Just right here in my line of sight. We came from all over. Have you noticed our pastoral staff recently? It wasn't purposeful. It's just what God had for us to grow together for the good of our church. Here's the current pastoral staff. We have a Vietnamese American guy. Pastor Byron, both sides of his family are from two different countries in Latin America. Pastor Jim, his ancestry, I believe, is German. I'm an American citizen, but I feel Mexican on the inside because I grew up in Mexico. There's no telling what I am. Gregory is African-American. We've got a little slice of the nations on the earth just in a pastoral staff of four people. Who does that? Jesus does that. See, if we took the time to delve into our histories, what we would discover in a congregation our size, we come from tribes and nations and peoples that hated each other, that brutalized each other, that murdered one another, that enslaved one another. And now here we are on the hottest day of the year in a tent hearing that the reason we're here and the reason we love the Lord and we love each other is because we are one expression of what God has been doing all along from Genesis to Revelation. God's purpose has never changed. He's still keeping his promise. And there's no other way to unity and togetherness and genuine love until we are together in God's family enjoying his forgiveness. And someday, God's purpose is going to be fully accomplished. To see the fulfillment of all that God's promised, you have to go to the end of the book. You have to look at future history, meaning what is being described here has not yet happened, but it's as certain as the birth of Jesus because God promised that it would, that it would happen. In Revelation chapter 5, John takes us into the throne room of God, and he gives us a picture of the worship in heaven that will occur someday in the future, and I want you to hear what is being sung to Jesus. The context is this, it is time to wrap things up. It is time for God to wrap up human history, save those he, are, he is going to save, and in the throne room of God, we're given a picture of that moment. Revelation 5 verse 9 says, they sang a new song, saying, they're singing to Jesus, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Here we are. 
from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. That's what God promised Israel all the way back in Exodus 19, remember? It's finally happened, but it's not just Israel, it's all of us. It's Latin America and Asia and Africa and immigrants across America who didn't know each other, whose families hated one another. Now we're together in the throne room of God, praising Jesus together. You were slain, and by your blood, by Jesus' crucifixion, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That's future history. That's where it's all headed. I hope that you can now see that this big, thick Bible, pages flapping in the breeze in front of me, this whole Bible, big as it is, tells a single story of a God by His own grace and because of His great love, determined to gather people from every nation. And now, in 2020, in these difficult times, you and I get to be part of God's fulfill, the fulfillment of God's plan. God will keep His promise. We get to obey Him and cooperate with Him so that the nations will know. What difference should this make to you? Well, this should change the way you look at your neighborhood. You should be able to look down your cul-de-sac, around your block, around your apartment complex, and see the people around you different from you as they may be as people for whom Christ died. People that were promised to Abraham way back in Genesis 12 when Abraham was promised that through his family all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You shouldn't let any division, any cause for human hatred to deter you from the purpose of seeing the vision from the throne room of God that someday from all tribes and nations and languages, God will gather worshipers. He will unite us as family and all these troubles will be over because we together have been loved and forgiven by God. It should orient your giving. The reason we give to a church family, to the general fund to support the work of this church from this corner, and to the mission fund to support the work of our missionaries, it's not a budget, it's not a program, it's not our idea, it's our cooperative, collaborative effort, everyone give, giving as generously as they dare to be part of what God promised to do all the way back in 2,000 years before Christ. It's the greatest privilege you could ever be a part of. This is what God is doing. This is what God promised to do. This is what God will not fail to do. If you will understand where you fit in the story and do your part through your witness around you and through your giving to reach those who are not near you, you will be part of God's great mission. The Bible is the story of God's mission, and we care about sharing the gospel everywhere because He does. That's what ties the Bible together. That is the purpose and the burning center of this church. That's the story the Bible tells us. This is the story. If we will be pleasing to God and serve His purpose in our brief lifetimes, this is the story we all have to be part of. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts. And if there's a single person here, Lord, whether they're here in the parking lot, Lord, and, or watching online today or some other time, they don't know you. That they would step into your family through simple repentance from their sin and simple trust in Jesus. That's what matters most to them. They can't join your story and be part of your work until they first do that. And if I could stop praying for a moment and just ask you, is there a single person here who doesn't have that assurance? It would be a shame and a tragedy if you heard about Jesus loving nations and tribes and languages far from you and you missed his love for you yourself personally. If you're not quite certain that Jesus has died and risen for you, you haven't trusted him to forgive you from your sins, this is me making the appeal. I'm inviting you personally. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus. I'm not talking to you about joining this church, 
changing your thoughts, trying harder, doing better. No, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to give up on your own futile efforts to save yourself and trust him instead. That's God's work. That's the preaching. That's the good news that Jesus died for sinners like me and like you. And if you will trust him with your life, turning away from your sin, he will most certainly save you. And if you will do that today, just call out to him in prayer and say, Jesus, please save me. I've sinned. I feel the distance between us. I know I've sinned. I know I've rebelled. I know I've ignored you. But I'm turning around right now and I'm asking you to save me. Please save me. Give me a home in heaven. Forgive my sins, please. And if you do that, take a moment longer in your bulletin. Find my email address or one of those phone numbers or on, in the online environment. Just let us know that today you've placed your faith in Christ. It's what matters most. It matters more than anything. Nothing else in this sermon matters more than you knowing for certain that you have your own relationship with God through the gift of his son, Jesus. And church, if you know this, this is our message. This is our purpose. This is the whole of scripture. This is why we live. Father, may it be, may we live to share this good news in our homes, in our neighborhoods, through our prayers and our support of those who will go in other places around our community to talk to people we don't know through our missionaries, Lord, nations we will never visit so that someday when we're in the throne room, we may see the nations and the tribes and languages and rejoice with you that you kept every promise and you were even kind enough to use us to fulfill that purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. And Crosspoint said, Amen. God bless you folks. Thank you for coming out in a day that is much more like Phoenix than Huntington Beach, California. I have it on good authority. You have now survived the hottest service of the year, maybe for the rest of our lives. It may never again be this warm. Come what may, we're going to be here. We're going to be in this tent. God willing, we will soon be back inside that building. We are here to love you and support you and care for you in any way we can. All you have to do is let us know. Uh, we obviously have a lot of chairs and a lot of canopies. Those of you who are able-bodied and have a little time, we would love to have your help taking all of this down for now. Let me say thank you. God bless you. And if you need us at any point during this week, please, please let us know. We're family and we want to serve you. God bless you. Bye-bye.